Hey y'all, welcome to Roots and Refuge Farm. My name is Jess, if you're new here. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. I am going to be sharing about one of my most favorite topics to talk about. If you're not new here, welcome back. I'm so glad that you're back. This type of video is very intentionally long format, so make yourself comfortable, put your headphones in and work on a task or get your crocheting in your lap, get your seed catalogs out, Get your notebooks out, garden planning. Um, we're gonna talk about seeds today. I am unboxing, not a huge order, but a pretty good little package of seeds here from uh, my friends over at In My Gardener. I do want to go ahead and give you a heads up. I'm actually hosting a garden planning webinar um, with a company called Seed Time. They have a program online that you can plan your garden and it is gonna be a live webinar. It's next Monday, February 5th. I've got a link to that that I will put in the show notes if you'd like to sign up to get an invitation to that. Um, and if you're not available for the actual live webinar, they'll send you the recording and these guys are going to be helping me using their program plan my raised bed garden i've been talking about how i wanted to have a little bit more structure this year so a lot of times i do fly by the seat of my pants in the garden and i'm really pushing myself it's one of the areas i'm hoping to grow in the garden this year as a gardener is following a plan that i don't forget to plant things that i don't miss out on things that I make the most of the space that I have. Link down below for that. The webinar is free. You can check it out, sign up. As for right now, let's hop in to opening this package of seeds. I did a video a week or two ago talking about like seed buying tips and I went really in depth about GMO and heirloom and hybrid and open pollinated seeds, where to buy them, um, how long they last, storage, all of that stuff. I'll put a link to that video as well. If you are fairly new to gardening or fairly new to buying seeds, it's okay that you have all of those questions. And unfortunately, a lot of times the answers are not as readily available as, as I wish they were. So that's why I made the video. Today, however, I'm just gonna talk about these varieties. So for me, one of the big values of doing like a seed unboxing video is that I can share with you why I bought things. I can share with you my past experience of the varieties that I purchased as well as what I'm looking forward to about new varieties. I can tell you how I use them, growing tips, and all of that. When I first started making seed unboxing videos, I felt a little silly because it made me think of my kids when they were little watching videos of other children like opening toys and I used to be like, why do you want to watch somebody else open their toys? Then I started making seed unboxing videos and I was like, oh, <laughs> somehow this gives us some sort of like dopamine hit. All right, here is a little collection of seeds from In My Gardener. If you're unfamiliar with In My Gardener, Luke has been here in the YouTube space for a lot of years, longer than me, and he has shared so much information on gardening, sharing tips. He started his seed company and provides a really great product. One thing that's notable about in my gardener seeds is that they're very affordable most packages are two dollars uh, which is really nice i've always had great success with his seeds growing well and he has a lot of really good variety because he he also likes to focus on heirlooms so there are a lot of great things to choose from through the in my gardener website i will put a link down below if you go there and say you want something and it is out of stock listed sign up for the notification or check back because they do restock their seeds um and that's that's the case with most seed companies. Whenever they're saying out of stock, they're, they, a lot of times that pop comes up because they're trying not to oversell, but that doesn't mean there won't be any more seeds till next year in most cases. So I have to say this one thing. I'm not gonna dive into all of the seed buying tips. I'm gonna leave that in the other video, but I will tell you that seeds don't expire. There are dates on seeds. Seed companies are required by law to put the dates of the year that it was packed for because they can lessen in germination rates as the time goes on uh, but some of the things that i purchase like they're coming in now it's the end of january it's almost february uh, some of these things i'm going to be starting soon some i'm going to be direct selling some of them i may not even plant until fall which is fine it they'll be completely okay if i save some of these seeds and don't plant them until next year or the year after they'll be fine as long as you keep them cool and dry they last for a really long time all right i guess i'm just going to 
dive in and start talking to you about these different varieties. It looks like this was probably packed somewhat in alphabetical order, but I've made a mess of it, so we're just going to start at the top of the pile and go from there. All right, the first thing I got is Italian large leaf basil, as well as a mammoth basil. So I want you to see these different pictures here. And my gardener does a really good job with their seed packet information. Uh, I really appreciate that. I feel sometimes when you're reading seed package information, it can be very, very confusing. Please do not be crippled by information or lack thereof on your seed package. It's I, I get the struggle of trying to put enough information for a person to have success with a plant in like a two by three inch space. I feel like and my gardener does a really good job because they give you harvest tips, they tell you when to sow things, and I really like that they have these little icons down the side that show how deep to sow things, that if it's container friendly and not or not. Like here it's got a little pruner that says promotes new growth. So I think it's pretty cool. They, they pack a good deal of information on here. If you ever have a seed package that you feel like is lacking in information, you can always just go put the variety in your search engine with the word growing tips and you'll find a lot of information. Just the, like with Google, like just the AI of Google will gather up where there's a pretty good chunk of information you'll get right off the top if you do feel overwhelmed. So with the basils, let's go back to the basils. I love basil. It tastes like summertime to me. It's a fantastic companion plant. If you are growing a vegetable garden, having diversity throughout your garden is really important. One, for your beneficial insects, for pollinators, for the insects that prey on pests and pest larvae. Uh, we want a diverse garden. We want to build a strong ecosystem, especially if we're trying to garden organically. That's a big key to success. Basils I love because they kind of have a dual purpose. One, they're culinary, so you can just pruning your basil, you can dry a ton and never have to buy basil again. And if you're also growing something like oregano and thyme and rosemary, you can make a lot of really cool herb mixes with dried herbs. Um, but basil is way more versatile than people realize. So I use it, I make tea with it. I have content about that. I have a blog post that lines out how to make basil tea. You can use any kind. You can use culinary basils. I really like Tulsi, which is holy basil, to make basil tea. And you just steep the leaves, add honey or sugar, and you've got an iced beverage that you grew in your garden, which is awesome. Obviously, we're accustomed to putting basils in Italian foods and uh, using it dried in our cooking, but one thing that I really love to do with basil is to chop up a bunch of the leaves along with lettuces in for salads. And I like pushing the limit and using basil in things you don't expect it to be in. So my favorite application of using like an Italian large leaf basil, which is similar to like a Genovese, it's just like a really basic basil. It's, it's mildly sweet. I would say it's a little more herbaceous than Genovese basil or sweet basil, which doesn't quite have the punch. This is more of a a mix between that kind of, I don't want to say the word spicy, I guess herbaceous is the right word, and the sweetness. Uh, but I took this Italian large leaf basil last year and I actually steeped it in cream and then made strawberry ice cream with that cream and made strawberry basil ice cream. And it was so good. It was really, really awesome. And I, I'm hoping to explore even more uses for, for basil this year. So that's why I got the, this, the mammoth basil. I particularly like for one application. It has these really large leaves. I don't know if it's the same thing, but there's another one called lettuce leaf basil that I've grown both. I can't tell them apart. So they're very similar. It is, they have these big lettuce type leaves. And my favorite use for these is to make, if you've ever been to like a P.F. Chang's or a Payway where they have like the lettuce wraps there where you cut up chicken and chestnuts and some different veggies and then it's got kind of like a soy sauce mix that, it, that it's in and you wrap it up in lettuce. It is so good in lettuce leaf basil or mammoth basil. Fantastic. And so that's the number one reason why I grow this. But I also like to just take a big piece of this, put it on a burger. If you're gluten-free, I haven't eaten burger buns the last couple years being gluten-free. So I just wrap my burger up in this and it's really nice. So that's why I'm growing that. All right. I got a pack of borage. Um, I will probably not need this this year because once you grow it, it tends to volunteer. However, I went ahead and got some. Uh, borage is really cool. Also a fantastic companion plant. 
or one more word on the basil. The beautiful thing with basil and why I love growing it in the garden is if you decide you don't want to prune it, keep up with it, you're done eating it, you just let it go to seed and pollinators absolutely love it. So if nothing else, I grow tons of basil, way more than I know that I'm going to use for food purposes because it really adds to that, that ecosystem in the garden. And borage is very similar. So borage flowers are actually edible. Um, they taste like weird little fuzzy cucumbers. So I know that might not really be selling it for you. Um, I can't say that I eat a ton of borage flowers. They're cool to like throw on a salad just for like the wow effect because they're really beautiful. I don't ever find myself like eating a salad being like, man, I wish this had some borage flowers on it. They don't add a ton regarding like flavor, but the color is nice. They're beautiful. One thing that is a really cool thing to do with borage, I did this for a baby shower once. You just freeze it in ice cube trays and then you can serve like beverages. Um, in the baby shower we did, we did kind of like a little mocktail and, and these were frozen in the ice cubes and it was just super cute. Uh, but borage is worth growing just as a companion plant. The bees, the butterflies, any sort of pollinators will flock to these plants. They do get really large. I have found borage tends to die back as the summer gets really hot. I live in a place that gets ex extensively hot. I mean, it's normal for us to be 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 Celsius or above regularly throughout the summer. Once you start getting to those temperatures, the whole garden suffers. I mean, the whole thing can get a little crispy and shade cloth is needed. Borage taps out. So usually my borage lasts until maybe early July, but I plant it every year anyway because it does add a lot of value. It's a big plant. It can, it can really fill up a space. I will start these from seed and I will plant them all over the garden and let them go until they die back and make the bees happy. Okay, Black Beauty eggplant, super basic. This is very similar to the eggplant that you see in the grocery store. I've grown 20 different types of eggplants. I really like different types of eggplant, but last year I found my like my true love of eggplants in baba ganoush, which is a roasted eggplant dip, which I've eaten multiple times before, but for whatever reason, last summer I could not get enough of it. And I very specifically, I had to order these seeds because I typically go for the streaky eggplants and the long white ones and all of the different unusual things. But for baba ganoush and for roasting eggplants, the ones that did the best were like the big globe ones. So I am growing this package of seeds just for baba ganoush. And I will make sure that I share the recipe with you guys. Anything that I'm mentioning here that you're like, oh man, I would really like to see that made, please comment. I do have my other channel, which is my cooking channel, The Farmer's Table. And all these things I'm talking about making, it's going, it's like preview of coming attractions. It's the content I'm gonna be making this year. And I can't wait to make baba ganoush for you guys because that means I get to eat it. <laughs> That's why I'm growing that. These actually I need to start here pretty soon. My estimated last frost date, which here in the Midlands of South Carolina where I am, it's roughly like the first week of April. And I go six weeks ahead of that for tomatoes and then I go eight weeks ahead of that for peppers and eggplants and like ground cherries, tomatillos. So these guys are going in soil here very soon. Obviously, if I were later than that, it would be fine. But I'm not, I'm not trying to figure out the latest I can start seeds. I'm trying to figure out the earliest. Here I have purple Vienna kohlrabi. Uh, this was just something that when we were starting seeds for our early spring garden, I realized I was out of purple kohlrabi. Um, I would say probably my favorite way to use kohlrabi is to make a slaw or cut it up into chunks and ferment it. I can't say that I have really explored kohlrabi in all of its uses. Those are really the main two ways that I have done it. If you have a way you love eating kohlrabi, please let me know because I would totally love to learn. Slow bolt arugula. This one I'm thinking is probably going to end up going in a green stalk. I love it on anything that is like fatty meat, like a burger. I love putting arugula on top because it's got such a good bite to it, but I can, I can just eat a straight salad of just this. It's spicy. I'll make a mustard dressing with like whole grain mustard, maple syrup, oil, splash of lemon juice, shake that up and toss arugula in it. So you got to have something that has a little bit of sweet and some acid to like cut through this 
the pungentness of it. But, oh man, a salad full of arugula with that kind of dressing and then some like dried cherries or dried cranberries or raisins and some nuts in it. You could put cheese in it too, but if you, I can't, I can't eat cheese anymore. Sad day. Um, it would be really good with cheese on it too. Okay, orange glow, watermelons. Some years ago, I was out at Baker Creek's Expo and they did a tasting um, watermelon competition or whatever and the orange glow won. And Will has mentioned these multiple times. He really likes them. I know that I've planted them before, but I don't know. I, I remember one year planting a bunch of watermelons and then having an issue with turtles. <laughs> <laughs> the most random thing to be plagued by the garden. But every time I would go out, I would be like, oh, look, this melon looks ripe. And I'd pick it up and like the whole bottom part of it was eaten off. And at first I was like, what is doing this? And then one day I found one of the, it, I, one of the turtles was out there. They were eating all my watermelons and my squash. I think that's the year I tried to grow the orange glowy. As it is, I can't say that I ever remember eating this one and I'm excited to give it a try this year. All right, Hill Country Red Okra. I, I think I can confidently say Hill Country Red is my favorite okra. There's another one called Alabama Red. The okra likes it hot. You can grow it other places and it will grow, but a lot of times it'll be spindly. Um, and okra can withstand a lot of neglect. If you've got like one area of your yard that has great soil and you have one area of your yard that doesn't and you're trying to garden in both, put the okra in the poor soil. It's not fussy. It will grow really well without having just like gobs of nutrients as long as it's warm. So if you live in a place that has like a really cool springs, wait to start your okra. You can start it indoors where you can keep it hot, but if you direct sow it outside and it's still getting pretty chilly at night, the okra is just really, it's not gonna grow much until it starts getting hot. You know, you kind of have to find that balance. For me, I usually sow my okra out like early May, uh, I, I wait, even though my frost has passed in early April, we can still have pretty chilly nights and I don't even bother sowing the okra because it's not gonna come up and do well while it's cold. So I just put it out at the beginning of May and usually we are swimming in okra by late July and then it produces all through August and into September just exponentially. We, last year we did the Hill Country or the Alabama, which they're like these short squatty pods, a good bit like rounder than your typical longer thinner okras. And my, my thing I like about these is you can cut them in kind of thinnish discs and they're good and round and they're just really cool to fry. They're different than what's at the store. They have good flavor and I like the shape of the pods. We do grow another local heirloom called Kibler okra very, very, very productive and very sweet. And then I've grown multiple other kinds of okra, but I think now I've pretty well settled in that if I have Alabama Red or Texas Hill Country, they're interchangeable to me. And our Kibler okra, that that's really kind of covering all of my needs. Okay, I got North Georgia Candy Roaster Squash. I have admittedly not grown tons of winter squash successfully. I've always really struggled with squash bugs. Last year, we grew hundreds and hundreds of pounds of a local heirloom pumpkin called the Dutch Fork Pie Pumpkin. We were completely uh, just overwhelmed with harvest, and so I'm feeling a lot of confidence. Will this grow well in my garden? That is to be determined. But the North Georgia Candy Roaster, I assume, being developed in North Georgia, which is pretty close to me here in Midlands of South Carolina. I'm thinking maybe I could have success with this, but it's a banana style squash. They're supposed to be really sweet, highest sugar content of any winter squash, and it has a stringless creamy flesh. So I'm thinking pies, I'm thinking it would be really good for like baking stuffed. That was really the idea I've had of being able to cut them in half and then stuff them with some sort of probably like rice, meat, pepper, other veggie stuffing mix. That would be really good. That's the plan there. Uh, some teddy bear sunflowers. These are really pretty. I've grown these before. I like growing lots of different kinds of sunflowers all over the garden. Again, for the pollinators and for me. 
Okay, I'm gonna put the tomatoes aside so that we can talk about all of these at once. I got quite a few. A beet assortment mix. I have historically shied away from buying mix packs for one reason. If I get a mix of, let's say, carnival beet assortment, that's how they're sometimes sold, or multicolor rainbow beet assortment, and I get them and I really, really like one of the beets and I want to grow more of that particular type, if it's an assortment, then I don't know what that kind is. However, in my gardener, must fill me on this. Their mix packages list out the varieties that make up the mix. So this is a mix of Kioja, uh, Cilandra, Detroit Dark Red, Bull's Blood, and Ruby Queen beets. So there's five different beet varieties in this uh, mix and if I love one I can probably look up these varieties and figure out which one that it is. Either way, I've been on a beet kick this winter. I did go ahead and get another package of Golden Detroit Beets. This is one of my most favorite. Beets, I, I understand beets are kind of an acquired taste. And a lot of people will say, well, I don't like beets, they taste like dirt. They actually do taste like dirt. They have a chemical compound in them called geosmin. It's the same chemical that is in the soil that when it rains gets released into the air that produces that smell after the rain. That's geosmin. It's in beets. Different beets have different levels of that. So if you think I really want to love beets, but I had one once that was really dirty tasting, you can look. Golden beets have one of the lowest concentrates of that geosmin compound. So golden beets are typically much more sweet and less earthy tasting. I actually like the earthy taste, turns out. First I didn't, but I have come to love beets. Um, this is Formanova beets. This is supposed to be a very sweet variety. Um, the package and what made me put this one in my cart was it said it's also known as butter slicer to, due to its texture. And with all beets, you can eat the greens. How I typically will do that is when my beets are coming up, they're young and they haven't really bulbed out a lot, I'll kind of pick some of the outer greens and sort of like rob a few of the greens from the beet while it's still growing. And then when it comes to harvest time, you can harvest the whole thing and use the, the, the greens as well. But I really like them in salads or um, whenever they're really young. Here we have another mix, the Kayla Bunga mix, which is totally cute, all you 90s kids uh, who watched Ninja Turtles. This has multiple different kales in it. When it comes to anything that is sold, like this picture shows the kales young as baby greens, uh, you can take a package like this and sow it dense and harvest the plants young as baby greens, or you could take this and spread these seeds out every 12 inches and get full size plants. Any sort of baby greens mix, lettuce mix is like that. Um, and it's nice if you are wanting to have some baby greens and some larger plants and you're wanting to have some variety, a package like this, just sow some of them close together and then take six, eight seeds and spread them out and you'll have all the kale you could possibly want for a $2 seed package. All right, I got some Sweet Gem Snap Peas. This is a new variety to me. Um, it says that it resists diseases and typically what takes my sweet peas out is that when they start getting stressed with the heat, um, they start getting diseased. Now, there's only so much that breeding can do. Sweet peas are not hot weather plants, but I'm going to go ahead and direct sow these very soon. I direct sow in February certain crops that are cold hardy. Peas, root vegetables, lettuces, kales, collards, brassica. It's a little bit of a risk because if we get some like Arctic snap and get really, really cold, it could damage my plants. I usually do this loosely. Um, sometimes I lose seeds and don't get anything, but a lot of times I do get something. With all of these things, if you sow them out and it's not getting warm enough for them to germinate, they'll just germinate later. I've done it that way for years. I go ahead and sow things out early. What I find is, is like with the peas, as they start coming up, they're just gonna be more acclimated to the cold than if I were to start them inside and try to move them out and then it gets really cold. So I'm gonna be direct sowing these out into my garden here in the next couple of weeks. This is a climbing variety, which 
peas come in either a, a compact or bush or determinate variety or they'll be pole or climbing or sometimes they're just called tall so this is going to need a trellis i have multiple places with trellises still sitting from the end of last year uh, if you do not want to provide a trellis just make sure you buy a variety that doesn't climb like this one this is the tom thumb dwarf pea i specifically purchased this to plant this in green stalks um, i'm not pressed for space but sometimes i will challenge myself to figure out solutions for things other people are dealing with and i wanted to put this it's a great container variety you could just do it in pots but i'm going to try that one in my green stalks next the spring blush pea so this has purple and white flowers and it has a really really pretty color to the pea it's got some nice tendrils it is a climbing variety this is one that will be um, also a snap pea which for snap peas I would say probably my number one way that we use these is I just pick them and literally we just eat them raw with like some ranch dressing. My kids will kill snap peas if I give them ranch dressing to dip them in. Um, but they're really good in stir fries as well. I got some purple potted pole beans. This is an old faithful variety for me. Very prolific. This is a climbing pole bean. Uh, so it ne definitely needs a trellis structure, but the beans are really pretty like deep purple fuchsia almost. Um, they do turn green when you cook them, but with a pole bean, basically with a bush bean all of your harvest is going to come in at the same time so I usually do plant both I usually will have some really substantial rows of bush beans so that after I plant those you know 45 50 days after when the flush all comes on at once I can go out and I can harvest a big bucket of beans and then I can go inside and I can can them all I've got them all ready at once with pole beans they come on over the course of months and the more you, as long as you keep picking them they're gonna keep setting flowers S plants are just trying to make seeds so if you let them mature and you let the beans dry on the plant on the first wave they'll stop setting flowers because they did their job they made their seeds so the more you pick the more you get with pole beans and so usually I have a smaller area of pole beans growing throughout the gardening year and then larger areas of bush beans so that these are what I'm going out and picking when I'm cooking dinner that day um, and if I end up with extra of these I can usually just lump them in with my bush beans as they come in and process them with that uh, they, they taste the same bush beans versus pole beans there's nothing in the flavor or texture that's necessarily different based on that but um, that's why I do both. So this is provider bush bean. This is one of the ones that I like to grow in excess of. Um, they have really nice long pods, five or six inches long, and they're very disease resistant. So that's, that's a really good one. Um, they are a little thicker. I also like, which I don't think I got any in this order. I think I already had some. I also like thin, like filet French style beans that are really thin and I usually grow some of both. All right, kakuzi squash. Do you guys remember my experience with this? If you've been with me very long, you remember the time that this squash took over my pavilion. So this is a beast of a plant. Um, this is an Italian squash that is grown in the summer, vining variety. It is very flavorful. I will tell you that the last time that I grew this, we were so absolutely overwhelmed with fruit that you know we ate a good deal of it but there was so much more that we ended up feeding a lot to our animals our pigs and that is one reason why i purposefully grow this so sometimes in the garden i'm growing simply because i want to cook all of the things but because i like to look at the farm and the garden as an ecosystem and it's like with the basil i plant way more than i need to consume because i know i can let that go to seed and it's going to benefit the ecosystem it's going to make a habitat and food for the beneficial insects so with having my whole farm i've got my cattle i've got my sheep we're about to get our goats you know some more goats we've got hogs uh, chickens geese ducks all of that there are plenty of critters that would be grateful for a taste of squash for me to be able to share and when i have something that is extremely prolific there's a sense of like food security that comes in that okay this is going to grow a lot if i really needed it it's awesome to know that i've got a lot but having something that is growing pounds and pounds and pounds and pounds of food just out of the soil and on the sunshine and on water 
that's awesome. That's offsetting my feed bill. So I decided to bring the kukuzi back to the garden. Um, the flavor they describe on the package, I think it's pretty good. It's their, their description is good. It says it's tender, almost cucumber meat zucchini. And I would say it's been some, it's been a while since I had tasted it, but I would say that's probably pretty accurate. It's kind of, it's kind of zucchini-ish. It's very close to a zucchini, but it's got more of like a a freshness to it. I, when we grew it last time, I definitely did a lot of them on the grill. So what I'll do is like, I would cut them into kind of like long spears almost, and then just put some oil on them, salt, pepper, garlic powder, and just grilled them. And that was like one of the most simple ways to use them. I also did like an Italian, like a more, more or less a marinara that I cut these up in and cooked it down in. And that was really good, um, making that on pasta. Um, it's also very commonly used in soups, but if you have an opportunity to talk to somebody who has, is from an Italian family, they've got their stories about kukuzi. It's very, and I think they s pronounce it, oh, I can't remember. Somebody help me out. Somebody told me once, it's not pronounced kukuzi if you are um, actually Italian. It's pronounced something else. I'm saving the tomatoes for last. Let's see. All right, I got all these peppers together. Let's look here. Uh, this is new to me, Adzuki bush bean. Um, it says it's an East Asian cooking staple, maturing with small beans, mainly grown for dry beans. Its creamy texture is prized for use in soups or as a base for sweet confectionery paste used in moki filling. These are also called mung beans, if you've never heard that. So this is kind of just an experiment thing. I'm going to sew probably this entire package. It's... I don't know, probably somewhere in the range of 20 something seeds. And that should fill up a little small raised bed area and it'll be enough for us to play around with. When it comes to, to growing dried beans, I've not done just a ton of that just because it can be very time consuming to shell them. But I have recently really found that I do love the task of shelling peas and shelling beans. And so this year I am doing more dried beans and I thought the mung beans would be a good thing to do. Uh, here are some seeds for some bunching onions. We're gonna we're gonna try it this year. It'll be nice to have those. I like I like bunching onions. I like eating them. I like cooking with them. Also got some jicama. So this is a plant if you're unfamiliar with it. That is very. It's kind of mix of potato and like a water chestnut. Like the f flavor and the texture of it. That's the best way I know how to describe it and it's pretty sweet and it can be used kind of similarly to potatoes. I've cooked with them some, not a whole lot. It's not something I've commonly purchased, but I have really enjoyed them when I've had them that other people have made them. This will be, my, this will be a first for me. I've never grown these before, um, but I, I know I like the flavor and I'm looking forward to having in this, these in the garden. So if you have any tips on growing this, please let me know. All right, I got some more radish seeds. Um, multiple different kinds. German Giant, let's see. German Giant, Watermelon, the Black Spanish, and Sparkler White Tip. All of these varieties are ones that I have grown successfully before. Um, I would say I really like the Watermelon Radish. It's really beautiful and this makes if you very, very thinly slice this and mix it in with onions and then pickle that, it makes a really good topping for anything where you need to cut a heavy or fat flavor. So like I will put that on tacos or, you know, in a, like a ground beef bowl. If you make like a teriyaki beef, serve it over rice, put this on top of it. Just alone, I mean, they're good, but they, they make a really nice garnish and it's colorful and beautiful. Um, as far as just like slicing up and eating raw, I typically do like the sparkler white tip. Also like French breakfast, that's another one that's really good. Um, and any radish, you can cube it and roast it 425 degree oven with like oil and salt and pepper. And you can do whatever seasonings you like. And it completely changes the flavor. It mellows them out. They're kind of more like a potato at that point. They're also good that way in an air fryer. You can air fry them so that they get a little crispy. Radishes are way more versatile than a lot of people realize because you can do roasting and pickling eating raw. They're not just some spicy garnish for a taco. And the beauty of these is, is if you learn to love them, like roasting them and find applications for them like that, 
they grow so fast. In ideal conditions, like springtime is pretty ideal conditions for radishes. More light, days getting longer, still not super hot, so they're not gonna go straight to seed or be really pithy. Um, you can go from seed to harvest in less than a month, which is awesome. So these are gonna get direct sown probably starting here in the next couple of weeks and then succession sown over the course of the next couple months um, to be able to have radishes whenever we want. American Purple Top Rutabaga. My favorite rutabaga is a yellow one, but I haven't met a rutabaga I didn't like yet. I really like this. It's very similar to a turnip if you've never eaten a rutabaga. Very, very similar. It's got a sweetness to it, a bite, a little bit of spice. Um, I like just cutting them up, boiling, and mashing them with like sour cream and chives. So good. That's, that's my favorite way for them. But they're also really good like... I, I'll dice them and when I roast a chicken, I'll put the rutabagas all around the chicken or mix them with potatoes and do potatoes and rutabagas and carrots together roasted. Um, there also can be pickled, fermented, the world's your oyster with the rutabaga. Here are, um, I don't know how to say this, Chagoin, I don't know. Turnips, white turnips. White turnips, very similarly to rutabagas, they taste a lot alike, they're a little sweeter. Here. Turnips are my go-to. I like fruit on salads. So if I make a salad, I usually cut up an apple or put some berries on it, just depending what's in season. But there's a pretty good period of the year that there are there's not fruit in season. And though I may use dried fruit, matchstick white turnips are really, really good on a salad. They have a sweetness to them. And when I don't have fruit, I'll do this. And again, make some sort of dressing that's got kind of a kick to it and dress that and I, that's literally my number one reason for growing white turnips is I like them like that. But they're also good mashed or put in soups or um, cut up and eat raw. I just eat raw turnips. Like, oh, they're good. It's got a dipping sauce. You can roast them. <laughs> I just, I love root vegetables. All right, sweet dumpling squash. Again, I was feeling some bravery on squash this year after my success last year. This squash is great for stuffing. They're really small. I mentioned earlier kind of making, I'll do like ground pork or ground beef and I'll take cooked rice, the ground meat, mix it together, put a ton of herbs in it. I love lots of sage. Dice up some peppers in there, onions, garlic, mix that together and then scoop the inside, cut a squash in half, scoop the inside out. I'll bake them for a little while till they start getting soft and then take that stuffing, put it in there, and then make like a butter maple syrup type glaze and put it over towards the end. So good. I love stuffed squash, just like I just described. Okay, here's a few random things I got. I got two different kinds of amaranth, love lies bleeding, and red spike. Amaranth is fully edible. The leaves can be eaten. They're very similar to spinach, so it is really... A good thing if you're trying to focus on growing food. It is a great companion plant. It really supports the pollinators. Um, my experience with amaranth, I've not eaten a ton of the leaves because my experience is, is that it draws every single pest insect in the garden to it. My amaranth has always been crazy riddled by pests. I am an organic gardener. I believe in creating an ecosystem. And here's the thing, if they're eating the amaranth and they're not eating the other stuff that I'm really trying to grow to eat, I'm happy with that. So I kind of grow amaranth around all over the garden for the beauty of it, for the benefit to the ecosystem, but also as a trap crop because, like I said, if the insects are there, they're not on the other stuff. At the end of the season, when all of the lovely long tendrils of seed pods have produced. Um, I will occasionally pull some and put them in a flower arrangement. I have not eaten the plumes. I've not done anything, but I save them all and feed them to my birds, my chickens. I do know that you can do a lot with the grain. They're considered like a superfood and all that stuff. I just have not personally done it, but I, I put a lot of amaranth in my garden and it ends up growing all over the farm. It reseeds very readily. Uh, this is one of the only flowers I bought on this order. Mostly I did food, but this is Dwarf Dazzler Red Cosmo. I love Cosmos. 
I think they are so cheerful. It's one of my favorite flowers. They reseed very readily. They have that really beautiful like English cottage feel to them because they're kind of wild. Um, and this was just a variety that I've never grown before. I've got lots of Cosmo seeds because I love them and they're pretty easy to save seeds for and they volunteer like crazy. So I just thought that that was really cool. All right, peppers, let's do the peppers. First, pimento pepper. So this is a really mild uh, pimento pepper. It's sweet, pretty basic. My hope this year is in the little four ounce uh, mason jars to actually can some pimento peppers that I could use in making like pimento cheese But they're also just really versatile and great to eat fresh on salads dip cut them up saute them with eggs in the morning I use them fresh in a lot of applications but one of my gardening goals this year is to preserve more peppers in versatile ways. So doing the little jars of pimento peppers is the reason why I got these. Anaheim chili peppers. These are mildly hot. They're not super spicy. Very, very versatile to be able to use in stir fries and different things. I plan on pickling these. I would like to try to smoke some. Uh, the, I mentioned the small jars for the pimento peppers. I also really want to do a whole bunch of those four ounce jars of diced up chili peppers for using in chili and enchiladas and stuff like that. I didn't save enough of those in the last previous couple of years and I end up just having to buy those little cans from the store so I'm just hoping to replace that. Um, Ancho Grande peppers, mildly hot, stuffed poblanos, so good. That's one of my favorite pepper meals to make. Uh, Serrano peppers, these are a little hotter than a jalapeno. My roasted red salsa, I've shared the recipe with you guys. It, I've got it up on my blog. I usually use serrano peppers in salsa. You can use whatever. You can use jalapenos, but these give you a little bit of a kick. They're very, very prolific. You really only need one or two plants would be sufficient for most people. I think I grew four last year and ended up just giving away a lot of those. <sighs> my pepper love, shishitos. I love shishito peppers. They are, I would say, mild peppers. A lot of them have like next to no heat, but occasionally you'll get one that's got a little bit of a kick to it. They're really great. You can, they're very versatile. You can pickle them, you can saute them, you can do whatever. But my favorite way is to take shishito peppers, puncture them, and then take the whole pepper, a bunch of them, and cook them down in a cast iron pan. You can put them on a griddle or a grill. If you've got like a rack, you can put them in. Cook them until they have like a couple of charred bits and then do like an aioli dipping sauce. Um, they're really good. You can put some seasonings on them, but I just salt and some lemon juice finished off. Oh, I love shishito peppers. Next, the giant Marconi. Another one of my very most favorite peppers. Very like good thick walls, really deep, rich flavors. Got a little hint of smoke to them. This says they get eight inches long. That's been my experience. Like they're they're pretty good sized peppers and they, they grow well throughout the season. I wouldn't say that they're insanely prolific. I mean, some of these other varieties that I mentioned, like the Serranos, I mean, you're gonna get easily a hundred peppers on, out, off of one plant or more even if you continue to pick them. The Marconis are large, so they don't produce quite as much fruit. Um, so I'm gonna have several of these. So there was this place that my aunt used to shop and she gave me years ago this smoked Marconi pepper flakes. And then my mom ended up finding out about it from her and she's gifted them to me multiple times. And this year I would really like to smoke some Marconis and make that seasoning for cooking because it's just really, really good. Actually, one of my favorite ways to use that smoked pepper flakes uh, with these sweet peppers is to take pecans and toss them with like some sort of oil or butter that has some maple syrup in it, some salt, and that smoked Marconi. Oh, they're really good, like some kind of sweet spiciness. All right, uh, Bikino yellow peppers. I grew these last year, really, really loved them. The name means little beak. You can kind of see why they come, come, why they have that name. They definitely have that look to them. Uh, very mild heat, kind of tart, kind of sweet. These and little jars pickled with some like garlic and little onion rings and stuff on a charcuterie board. So cute and very tasty. 
Numex Joe Parker, also just a great roasting pepper. I would say this is somewhat similar to the Sweet Marconi Red, um, real thick walled, big peppers. What I like doing with these, and you could do this with the Marconis as well, or any bell pepper. I typically lean towards the thicker walled sweeter peppers than just plain bell peppers. But you can take these and kind of slice them in big pieces so you have like a whole side of the pepper. And um, grill them, like blacken them really good, and then pack them in oil. And you can stick that in the fridge and keep it so that when the peppers aren't growing anymore, you can pull those out, dice them up, and throw them in your eggs in the morning, and that's what I really like these for. Next, cayenne orange. I've grown cayenne peppers many times, made my own cayenne uh, pepper powder, but I thought the orange one would be just an interesting twist on that. All right, we're getting through it, guys. Oh, I love talking about seeds and gardening. Here we have, my precious, the tomatoes. Let's go through these. Now, I have not fully assessed my tomato seed stores yet. So some of these were probably excessive and things I didn't really need, but I went ahead and grabbed them anyway, just in case. Um, I do share a lot of seeds with people, so I never worry too much about getting a little extra because I'll just bless somebody with them. So first, the triple crop tomatoes. This is one of the first tomatoes that I ever had super great success with. They're very, very, very productive. This was actually originally created as a greenhouse variety. Um, they are made to be grown in greenhouses. I've grown them out in the open as well as in high tunnels and they lasted longer in the high tunnel. They were a little bit more prone to getting disease outside, but some of the biggest tomatoes I've ever grown were from the triple crop variety grown outside. Um, really good classic red tomato flavor. They have potato leaves, which is kind of interesting, and I really like them. Uh, next, Big Rainbow, one of my favorite tomatoes. It's got really lovely red streaks and this big orange tomato. These tomatoes do get really large, especially when you prune down to one main leader on the plant. And I've always had really great success with them. It's very common to have fruits that are between one and two pounds with these. Dr. Witchy's my old buddy. So interesting story about this tomato. Did you know Dr. Witchy was a retired dentist whenever he decided to purchase a circus? He was the co-owner of a circus and he actually grew and developed his tomatoes using elephant manure. Interesting fun fact. I haven't been able to get my hands on any elephant manure to grow these to the to the history that they hold, but uh, I have had great success with them. I've been growing this tomato for years. It is very common for this to produce fruits over a pound. On average, I think last year, my Dr. Witchy's tomatoes all came off around 20 ounces each, uh, but I've had them get as big as about two and a half pounds. But they have low acid with a really good tomato flavor that's really on the fruity side and i love growing all the different colors of tomatoes because you have some that are more smoky with like that rich umami flavor some that are a little on the fruitier side yellow tomatoes are typically going to be more fruity lower ass less uh tangy than maybe your classic reds or pinks and then of course your purples are going to have more rich flavor i like having multiple kinds of tomatoes and slicing them super thin and having tomato sandwiches or making tomato dishes with all the different flavors because it just makes things taste better next Paul Robeson. I love that these two are next to each other. If I could only grow two tomatoes in the whole world, it would be these two. Of course, that would be sad even there. I want to grow all the tomatoes. I have lots of varieties that I really, really love. However, I think with these two, they have the versatility to be able to do pretty much anything with. Um, the Dr. Witchies has doesn't have a lot of seeds in it. They're very, very meaty. You can cut through one of these tomatoes and only see like a handful of places where there are seeds. So if you don't like that gel texture of the inside of a tomato, something like this would be good. Paul Robeson, the best tomato I ever tasted. Of course, it was a summer afternoon, late in the season. It was hot. The tomato was extremely concentrated in sugars. I was probably hungry, and hunger is, frankly, the very best sauce for anything that you eat. But I pulled a tomato off the vine. I took a bite out of it, and I literally sat down on the edge of the garden bed and looked at it and thought, oh my God, I've never tasted a tomato that tastes this good. And that has just become an infamous moment in my mind. I don't know that can ever be passed. And it was old Paul that did it. Rich, deep, purple, smoky, umami flavor, fantastic tomato. 
Next, the Gobstopper. Um, green little cherry tomatoes. I love having a variety in cherry tomatoes because they're great for snacking or for stir frying or making confit, um, for drying and eating dehydrated. And I like it that you can grow all different colors and varieties that have different flavors so that when you sit down and eat a handful of them, you're having a, an experience with lots of different flavors. I've grown this before. I couldn't say it then either. Where, where a kawaii? Um, several people told me last time how it was pronounced and I'm sorry, I don't remember. This is a dwarf variety. Last year, I went through a lot of trouble to obtain a lot of dwarf seeds to grow in my green stalks and I ended up stunting a bunch of them because I had the shade cloth on my greenhouse and I thought, oh, it'll probably be fine. It was not fine and those plants never fully grew right. Now, I started more after the fact, once I realized like, oh, this is not going well, I started another round and planted those out in the green stalks, replacing a lot of the original ones. Those grew really well, but at that point it was already into the heat of the summer and tomatoes start struggling whenever it's 90 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius, which most of our late summer is at least that hot every day. Uh, so I'm going to try again this year. I'm going to do my dwarf tomatoes again, and we already took the shade cloth off, so I know that they'll do okay. And I got these to, to add to that. Um, this one is new to me. This is the Perrin Spray List tomato. It's a semi-determinate. Um, I saw this on In My Gardener's website, and it, it boasts being very disease resistant and being a very high producer with it being disease resistant. Being in the south where it's very, very humid, I often struggle with my tomatoes later on in the summer. They just get blight. They just get disease. It's part of the humidity. I prune. I make sure we have airflow. I do all the things that you're supposed to do. My tomatoes still get sick. And I've just accepted that that's the reality of growing where I grow. However, I thought it would be interesting to try a variety that was supposed to be disease resistant. So that's why I got this for. And we're going to give it a try. Next, the sweetie tomato. Very classic red cherry tomato. Uh, very productive. They grow a long time. They're real sweet. Kind of basic, but I always grow these. The A. Blinken, this thing is a beast. This tomato gets huge. If you have a tomato growing contest that you are entering in, or you're wanting to put a fruit in the fair, or you're wanting to do anything that is a competition for the size of your tomatoes, A. Blinken, if trellis to a single liter, it's very easy to have three pound fruits on this. If you've got the nutrition in your soil and you, by, by, I said trellised, if pruned, to a single liter. Where the plant can put its focus on less fruits, they'll get a lot bigger. Whereas if you let it grow bushy, you'll get more fruits, but they'll be smaller. Um, a. Blinken is huge. Like this tomato gets really big and it tastes really good. It's a good one for um, like any classic tomato usage. So if you're trying to make like spaghetti sauce or salsa, it does pretty well. Um, it does have a little more liquid in it than maybe like the Dr. Witchies. But for any of my big heirloom tomatoes, if I'm wanting to make something out of them that I don't want them to have a ton of juice in it, I just roast them first. So for instance, I make salsa out of all heirlooms and roast the tomatoes first and then just drain off whatever liquid came off, came out in the roasting. So A. Blinken's always worth growing. Pineapple tomato, very, very similar to Big Rainbow, these two. I would say the pineapple tomato is probably a little more yellow and I would say it probably has a little bit more tang, but it also is very similar in the fact that a lot of the fruit goes between one to two pounds each, grows very similarly, performs very similarly to the Big Rainbow. I grow both of them because I just really like them. If I had to choose one, it probably wouldn't matter to me because they're very similar. I think I would... I don't know which one I would choose. They're pro I, I would probably eeny, meeny, miny, moe if I had to choose one between these because they're both good. I do think they're a little different, but they kind of have that sweet and sour thing, a little bit of a tang with the sweetness. And I like growing both of them. As I said, I like to have a variety. So there's my seed haul and a little bit about what I'm doing with it. 
Um, you'll notice I didn't have any brassicas in this, really. I guess I got the kohlrabis, but for the most part, I'm, I wasn't really focusing on that. I knew that I was going to be getting these seeds in kind of close to seed starting time. So I mostly focused on things that could be direct sown or started right after I got them. And this did not disappoint. Let's see. I'm pretty sure I paid a about a hundred and fifteen dollars for this it doesn't say it on my receipt i can't remember it's been a couple weeks ago that i ordered it i've had this sitting and i waited until i could open it with you guys but like i said in my gardener has really fantastic value uh if you're if you're getting seeds you could get these and split the package with somebody and potentially get your garden started for a really affordable price and i like shopping with them because they are doing so much to benefit the gardening community as a whole you know sometimes whenever you're trying to support causes a lot of times it comes down to okay well now I'm gonna have to pay more to get this well sourced and to support a cause and in this case you actually can buy seeds supporting um, a small business and a family that's doing a lot to teach people about gardening without having to pay a lot extra you actually save money which is awesome so thank you guys for hanging out with me today I hope you will join me in this gardening year uh, by subscribing and engaging with me on these videos. I will be sharing my process from seed starting to harvest and then into the kitchen uh, here at Roots and Refuge and then also with the cooking over at my other channel, The Farmer's Table. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you have a great gardening year and bless you until next time.